Shroud of Turin. Believers think this is the death shroud of Jesus Christ. But carbon dating says it's a fake. For decades, science has failed to discover how the bloodied image of a man formed on this cloth. It's not a painting. It's not a print. It's not created by any known artistic technique. Now, a controversial theory says it could be the work of one of the world's greatest artists. The Shroud of Turin does not belong in a cathedral or a church. It belongs in a science museum. Could the most outrageous hoax of all time be the work of Leonardo da Vinci? The faint and ghostly image of a slaughtered man on a sheet of linen. Blood and sweat stain the cloth. Horrific wounds cover his back. Puncture marks scar his hands and chest. And a ring of blood surrounds his head. For centuries, this relic was thought to be the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. Christianity's most precious relic. But how the shroud image was formed has baffled scientists for decades. Let me tell you that in the last 30 years, I've probably looked at 50 different attempts to duplicate the shroud. Making images with the same chemical and physical properties, not one person has ever even come close. Science hasn't been able to solve this mystery. Despite hundreds of hours of tests, they've not been able to recreate the image on the Turin Shroud. Whoever faked this precious relic was a master of their art, a scientist, an anatomist, and an inventor. One of the most controversial theories says that the Shroud is the work of Leonardo da Vinci. He created the world's most famous painting, the Mona Lisa. But did he also create this sacred relic? One of the earliest written accounts of the shroud was found in the parish church of Lire, France, around 1353. Today, the shroud is sealed inside a bulletproof glass chamber in Turin Cathedral, Italy, hidden from view beneath this cloth. Even though they can't see it, thousands of pilgrims still flock to this church to pray before what they believe is the burial shroud of Jesus Christ, soaked with his sacred blood. The shroud is made of herringbone linen 14 feet, 3 inches long by 3 feet, 7 inches wide. In the center of the shroud, measuring just over 13 feet, is the front and back image of a man's body. Over the centuries, the linen has been touched by thousands of hands, burnt in two fires, and soaked by water. Despite the damage, the image itself has survived intact though incredibly faint. When the contrast is increased, the image of the man can clearly be seen. Despite decades of research, how this image was formed is still a mystery. But there's more to the shroud than meets the naked eye. Just over a century ago, the first major breakthrough in shroud research was made using the new science of photography. In 1898, the Savoy family, the owners of the shroud for over 400 years, employed Secondo Pia, an amateur photographer, to take the very first photographs of their holy relic. What he discovered was totally unexpected. Pia had stumbled upon one of the biggest mysteries of all time. He opened up his shutters that morning with the first negative of the face. He almost dropped the plate, and he wrote in his book that he was looking into the face of the Lord. 
When the shroud is viewed as a photographic negative, the detailed picture of a man horrifically wounded and covered in blood leaps into focus. To the naked eye, it just looks like a very long piece of cloth with the outline of a scorched man on it. But if you see it in photographic negative, it kind of leaps into life. It's immensely detailed. Um, and the image, of apparently, of a real man who was horribly crucified. To believers, the detailed negative image offered more evidence that this was the real burial shroud of Jesus, soaked with his holy blood, and proof that he died and rose from the dead. In 1978, nearly a hundred years after Pia's discovery, the Shroud of Turin research project, known as STIRP, was given permission by the Savoy family to scientifically examine the cloth. Over 20 of the world's top scientists from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Los Alamos, and Sandia Laboratories arrived in Turin, Italy to begin the detailed analysis of the Shroud and its mysterious image. Barry Schwartz was the official photographer for the team. Sturp's primary objective was to go to Turin and try and determine how the image was formed. The Sturp team were hardcore scientists, and some of them were men of faith, some of them were not, but this was not about religion, this was about science. For five days and nights, Sturp examined the shroud and its faint image. The properties of the shroud's image that make it so unique, first of all, it's so subtle. You know, when you stand within arm's reach of the Shroud of Turin, it's almost impossible to know what you're looking at. Sturp's primary goal was to find out if the shroud image was a painting. They analyzed the cloth with X-ray, infrared, and ultraviolet light. They removed samples of fibers and collected particles from the weave. But the more tests they did, the more mysterious the image became. The conventional wisdom was that it was most likely a painting. And I thought, well, I'll get there and I'll see the paint and I'll see the brush strokes and I'll come home and I'll have a free trip to Italy out of the deal. After three or four minutes of looking at it up close and personal, I knew that it wasn't a painting, and I knew that whatever it was, this was going to be a longer project than I thought it would. The Sturp investigation did find minute traces of paint on the shroud, but in such a low quantity as to be almost invisible. If all of the paint particles that were on the shroud were sort of scraped together into one pile, you would still need a microscope to see them. Sturp also discovered that the image itself lay only on the very surface of the linen threads. When any liquid, like paint, is applied to cloth, it's always drawn down into the fibers. It's a process known as capillary action. But this hadn't happened. The image could not have been painted. Because the image sat only on the very top fibers, scientists thought it may have been burnt onto the cloth. To test the theory, Sturp analyzed the shroud with an ultraviolet camera. Scorched linen will fluoresce under certain types of UV fluorescence photography. So when we photographed the shroud with that UV photography, all the scorches fluoresced exactly as expected. The image did not by the fact that it does not, we can easily and I think confidently say the shroud was not formed by heating the linen in those areas of the image. Although the scorch marks left by the two fires glowed, the image of the man itself didn't. This told scientists the image couldn't have been made by heat. So if the shroud image wasn't made by heat, paint, or any pigment, and sat only on the top of the fibers, how was it made? Despite hundreds of hours of tests, Sturp failed to discover the answer. Our initial purpose was to go to Turin and determine how the image on the cloth was formed, and after all this, we couldn't give an answer to that question. 
even though investigators couldn't identify how the image was made, they knew carbon dating would tell them when the cloth was woven. In 1988, the Vatican gave permission for a piece of the shroud, roughly four inches square, to be cut from the left-hand corner. The cloth was divided and sent to three independent carbon dating laboratories, Arizona, Zurich in Switzerland, and Oxford in England. Carbon dating such a holy relic was very controversial as the process destroys the sample. Six months later, the results were announced. They caused an international uproar. All three labs arrived at the same conclusion. They were 95% certain that the cloth and the shroud was made over a thousand years after Jesus' death, between 1260 and 1390, which meant the Turin Shroud had to be a medieval fake. But if it was a fake, who had the skill to create an image so brilliant that even 20th century scientists couldn't discover how it was made? In 1988, carbon dating left little doubt that the Turin Shroud was a medieval forgery, created over a thousand years after Christ's crucifixion. But the date didn't tell scientists how this mysterious image was made. Was this image left by a real human corpse? Frederick Zugabe has analyzed countless crime scenes in his 50-year career as a forensic pathologist. He thinks the blood pattern on the shroud is consistent with a real victim of torture and crucifixion. Features that you see are the marked injuries here. For instance, there's swelling above the eyes. There's marked swelling below the right eye and the cheek here, and some swelling below the left one here. You can see it's really only a cartilage separation from a blow to the nose. On the chin area, there's swelling on the chin area uh, in this region. The hair is saturated uh, with blood, but there's blood saturation here. Even if this isn't Christ, the man appears to have suffered a horrific final few hours. <laughs> The body on the shroud seems to be covered with scars from a flagrum, a whip embedded with pieces of metal. The bits of metal would penetrate the flesh, ripping nerves, blood vessels, and so forth. Because of the weight of them, they would carry even to the front of the body, ripping the front as well as the back of the body. In the case of the Shroud of Turin, the legs, the back, Front of the body, neck, and all show over a hundred lash marks. The most dramatic wounds on the shroud convince Zugabe that this man was nailed through the hands. The Shroud of Torin shows the wound in the wrist area in the back of the hand. If the nail went through here at the base of the thumb region here, it would emerge exactly where the Shroud of Turin shows it and would be in an extremely firm place that would hold several hundred pounds. Even though the blood flow and views convince Zugabe that this is the image of a real crucified man, carbon dating said it is almost certainly not the image of Jesus. But who is it? And how did their image transfer onto the cloth? For decades, the greatest scientific minds tried to recreate the shroud image by wrapping real bodies in burial cloths. Forensic anthropologist Emily Craig explains that each time they tried, they ran into a problem known as the globe effect. One of the theories is that the shroud cloth draped an actual person and picked up the pigment across the entire face. That really doesn't work because the proportions change. If you look at a, a three-dimensional figure like this, from ear to ear, 
it's approximately seven inches. The proportions are correct. You pick up a piece of cloth, you drape it across that same figure from ear to ear, and then you measure that, and it's much greater than seven inches. You cannot drape a three-dimensional object with a piece of cloth and get the correct proportions. Whenever a flat cloth wraps a three-dimensional object like a human head, the image it transfers to the cloth is always distorted. The ears are so widely spaced that the face looks bloated and inhuman, very different to the shroud image. Some scientists argue that a column of gas escaped from the corpse and projected an image onto the cloth. The parts of the body closest to the cloth, like the tip of the nose, the forehead, and beard, left the darkest marks. This projection theory could explain how the image of his front formed on the shroud. But what about the image of his back? The man's back must have been in direct contact with the lower sheet, his full weight pressed down onto the linen. This should make the whole of the back image look like a solid block of color. And yet, the image of the man's back is no darker than the front image. The image of the man's body is so perfect, it looks like it was created for display. If this is true, this had to be the work of an extraordinary forger, a master of their art. I think they set out to make it look like the shroud had covered the body of Jesus, and they did it. It's brilliant. But who had the skill to create such a convincing image of Christ? An image so good, leading forensic investigators think it's of a real man. The faker of the shroud had to be a heretic, someone with no fear of faking Jesus' holy redemptive blood. He had to have a grasp of anatomy, and he had to have at his fingertips a technology that would completely fool everyone until the 20th century. Controversial theory by writer Lynn Pignett and historian Clive Prince says that all the clues point to Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest artists who ever lived. A man who refused to live by the Christian church's rules and whose lifestyle outraged society. Leonardo didn't want to create anything that could be exposed as a, a painting, a drawing, a print, something that was dyed on onto the cloth. Um, he wanted to come up with something that seemed miraculous. Did the master artist and heretic risk his life faking one of the most important religious relics of all time? The Turin Shroud is the world's most famous and mysterious relic, and almost certainly a medieval fake. Whoever made this image was a skilled artist. But could it be the work of Leonardo da Vinci? Da Vinci was born in Italy in the 15th century. He created some of the world's most valuable paintings, including the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. Leonardo was an engineer, inventor, anatomist, and he pioneered our understanding of optics. He was at the forefront of the revolution in art and science, known as the Renaissance. Leonardo had a remarkably modern mind. He saw himself as being somebody that was shaping the future. But did he have the skill to create this realistic image of a tortured and crucified man? Using a technique scientists still haven't been able to unravel. The secret to Leonardo's success was his use of direct observation. Da Vinci believed that to really capture the likeness of a subject, he literally needed to get under their skin. Leonardo wanted to understand how human bodies walk and see and behave 
he thought, well, I have to peel back that skin and see the muscles and understand the size of the muscle and the place of the muscle and, and how they move. In a damp basement of a Florence hospital, Da Vinci secretly dissected the dead. He took them apart, piece by piece, as he tried to uncover the human body's deepest secrets. Leonardo was the first artist to carry out dissections, ever. It's really amazing. Earlier in the Renaissance, there were people interested in the human body, but no one thought about doing a dissection. Da Vinci removed internal organs and drew detailed sketches of muscle and tissue, then wrote a series of rules on human anatomy. He also devised a system of proportions that would allow him to draw the perfect face. Leonardo's experiments with cadavers gave him an unrivaled knowledge of anatomy, far greater than many surgeons of the day. It also gave him unusual access to broken bodies and blood, the materials to recreate a realistic image of torture and crucifixion, just like the shroud. In one of his notebooks written around about 1490, he refers to um, borrowing from somebody a specimen of a bone that um, had been pierced with a nail. There's only one reason to be interested in that, because you're studying the anatomy of crucifixion. Da Vinci had the skill to create this realistic image, but why would he risk eternal damnation faking such an important religious relic, the burial cloth of Christ? The answer is Da Vinci wasn't a devout Christian. He was a man of science, not religion. Leonardo refused to live by the church's strict rules. He worked on the Sabbath, he was a vegetarian, he dabbled in alchemy. All these acts made him a heretic in the eyes of the strict church. You know, faking Jesus' redemptive blood would not cause him any problems because he wouldn't have believed that he's gonna be damned for it. Da Vinci may have been motivated by more than heresy. Medievalist Larissa Tracy thinks Leonardo would have been commissioned to fake the sacred relic by wealthy patrons. A relic like the Shroud would give a family who owned it a great deal of political and religious status. It would give them income in their church as pilgrims flocked to it to see it. The Turin Shroud isn't the first time someone has faked a burial shroud of Christ. The earliest known record of the Turin Shroud dates to Lyre, France in 1353. But this shroud is thought to have looked very different to the one we see today. It was owned by the de Charnays, descendants of the outlawed Knights Templar and one of France's oldest noble families. Great crowds of people flocked to see the sacred relic. The shroud brought the de Charnays great wealth until the 14th century when it was denounced as a very bad and obvious painting. In 1389, the Bishop d'Arcis writes a letter to Pope Clement VII complaining about this false relic of the shroud that's being displayed at a neighboring church. He's complaining that his predecessor had been duped into believing in this farce, had found out that this was a fraud. 30 years earlier, and that his major complaint was that this shroud was bringing in people of pilgrims and money to a small local church, and he wanted the Pope to essentially stop them doing it. In 1453, Louis de Savoy, the head of Italy's most powerful family, bought the disgraced shroud from the de Charnays. For the next 50 years, it was rarely seen. At some point over the decades, the shroud underwent a seemingly miraculous transformation. When it reappeared, it was no longer seen as an obvious painted fake. The Turin shroud was praised as a true holy relic. Even the Pope declared it genuine. It wasn't just the attitudes that had changed to the shroud. We believe it was actually the shroud itself had changed, that they'd come up with a new improved version the new improved shroud could have been made when the previous fake was out of sight at the end of the 15th century, a time when Leonardo was at the height of his creative powers. 
did Da Vinci and the powerful Savoys conspire to fool the world? The Turin Shroud is the Christian world's most famous relic, but historical records suggest this is a new and improved version of a much earlier shroud, one that was denounced as a painted fake in the 14th century. It is possible that the shroud we have today is not the same shroud that appeared in Le Ray. The suggestion is, is that perhaps another shroud was created to replace the earlier one. It would have been very possible to redo a relic, particularly if the relic is out of, out of sight and out of view for a number of years. Did the Shroud's new owners, the Savoys, turn to the greatest artist in all Italy to forge a more authentic looking version? Da Vinci had the necessary skills. He knew enough about anatomy and about the physical muscular structure of the body. Da Vinci had all of the tools to create a, an image like the Shroud. Leonardo worked for many of Italy's richest families. In Florence's Royal Library, there's evidence that connects him directly to the Savoys. This drawing is believed to be a self-portrait of da Vinci. It's owned by the Savoys, just like the Turin Shroud. If the Savoys did commission Leonardo to fake a more authentic looking relic, this was nothing new. The business of faking relics was unfortunately very widespread in the Middle Ages. By the end of the 14th century, when the Shroud of Turin appears in France, there was a very widespread culture of church corruption. Relics drew crowds of pilgrims and their money. The most lucrative were the ones that related directly to Christ's body. You have the, the clippings of Christ's toenails. You have bits and slivers of the Holy Cross, thousands of pieces of the Holy Cross. You have the Holy Foreskin. There were at least four different shrouds in the Middle Ages purported to be the shrouds of Christ's burial. The Shroud of Turin is the only one that has an image. But the Shroud of Turin was considered the ultimate relic because if real, it was a physical link to the tortured and crucified body of Christ. The burial blood he cast off when he was resurrected. To have, you know, the, the full length body image of Jesus, allegedly, um, and covered in his holy redemptive blood is absolutely it. You know, that you couldn't get a better relic than that. Fall down and worship the Savoys. No written evidence exists that proves da Vinci did create the Turin Shroud. He didn't write about it in any of his notebooks, but he never wrote about the Mona Lisa either. If da Vinci accepted the Savoy's commission, he would have been forced to work in complete secrecy. If a relic was determined to be faked, the identity of the artist largely would never have been revealed. They probably would never have admitted fully that the relic was a fake, because it was dangerous to admit that something that people put their devotion in was faked. There is a problem with the da Vinci theory. Carbon dating says the fabric of the shroud was woven between 1260 and 1390, but Leonardo wasn't born until 1452 over 60 years later. Although the cloth can be carbon dated, it's impossible for scientists to date the actual image itself. But it's entirely likely that if da Vinci was trying to recreate a thousand year old burial wrap, he wouldn't have used a piece of cloth straight from the loom. He would have found material that looked old Da Vinci was in the perfect place. Florence was a great center of trade in Leonardo's day. It would have been relatively easy for someone like him to get hold of old cloth. Da Vinci was in the perfect place, at the perfect time, to recreate this relic. But if it was him, how did he create such a mystifying image? Now, 
a groundbreaking discovery may finally expose the secret of the image on the shroud and explain how an artistic genius managed to fool the world. Last 40 years, scientists have tried and failed to discover how the image on the Turin Shroud was made. The blood flow and wounds seem to be consistent with a man who was beaten, whipped, and crucified. But forensic anthropologist Emily Craig thinks the shape and dimensions of the body betray the image as a fake. Anatomically, it's, it's not correct. The arms are just too long, the fingers are too long. The head and face are not in proportion to the rest of the body. It's different height from front to back. As an anthropologist, I can pretty well guarantee that people are the same height, whether they're, you're looking at the front or the back. And everyone that tries to explain proportions of the arm goes back to rigor mortis and the, and the uh, body being bent. But it's not. It's, it's just wrong. These imperfections intrigued art historian Nicholas Allen. He has studied the shroud since the carbon dating results were announced over two decades ago. Instead of uh, researchers trying to find out how the shroud was made, they immediately dismissed it as some meaningless hoax. And personally, I thought, well, that's not the end of it. How did they do it? So I set out to find out how it was done. Allen believes that the key to solving this riddle lies in the man's strange dimensions. After over 20 years of research, Allen has developed a theory which explains these distortions. He thinks the burial cloth is the world's first photograph. If you look at the Shroud of Turin as it appears to the naked eye, you see a negative image of a human being. And if you take another photograph of that, you produce a positive image of that human being, which means the shroud is acting as a negative. And that in itself is a very good clue that it was made photographically. This image of a farm building is thought to be one of the world's first photographs. It was taken in 1825. But is the Turin Shroud a much earlier example of a photograph? Although the camera wasn't invented until the 19th century, the optical device that was its precursor, the camera obscura, had been around since 400 BC. To test his theory, Allen sets out to recreate the shroud image by building a camera obscura. Allen hangs a life-size model of a human body outside a building. Inside, he has blacked out a room, and in the wall, he has placed a round crystal lens. Alan then stretches a length of cloth over a frame. The cloth has been soaked in silver sulfate, which makes it light sensitive, just like photographic film. All the materials Alan uses were freely available 15th century Italy, the time when da Vinci was at the height of his creative powers. Once the lens is uncovered, the light streams into the room and projects a photographically perfect upside-down image of the body onto the linen. This is exactly the same as a film camera, but instead of the image being projected onto film, it hits the light-sensitive linen. The silver sulfate in the cloth reacts with the ultraviolet rays and begins to change color. A permanent image of the model slowly burns onto the cloth. You could say that the image is made by a form of scorching, but this scorch is not made through heat. It's made through a chemical reaction. The process can take up to three days to form an image. Once the lens is covered and the lights turned on, the projected image disappears and leaves behind a faint scorch mark. But when the cloth itself is photographed, the negative reveals a detailed image of a man's body, 
just as it does on the shroud. When I got my very first image in the early 90s, I was, was very, very excited because it, my hard work had paid off. Alan believes the shroud image was made using a series of lenses and three separate primitive photographic exposures on one sheet of linen. One for the front of the body, one for the back, and a more detailed image of the head. This would explain why the head appears to be too small for the body, and also why the front and back images are not the same size. It is fairly difficult to match up an image of, say, the head of a subject with a separate body at a later stage. And if one is just using one's eyesight and no measuring equipment, I'm sure you could be up by quite a few percent. Once the image was burnt onto the cloth, Alan thinks the artist applied real human blood to mimic the wounds of torture and crucifixion. Alan wants investigators to re-examine the shroud. He believes the linen may still hold a minute trace of silver sulfate. If that test could be done, it would answer for once and for all this so-called mystery. Because if there is silver bound in the linen at a molecular level, it would be the final support for the photographic hypothesis. If Alan is right, and the image on the Turin shroud was made using a camera obscura, then Leonardo da Vinci was qualified to be the man behind the lens. Da Vinci was fascinated by light and lenses, and in his notebook is one of the earliest known drawings and descriptions of a camera obscura. It shows light passing through a lens, inverting and then being projected onto a flat plane. He called it his oculus artificialis, or artificial eye. If anybody had the capacity and the skill to work with camera obscura or any early photographic technique, it would have been Leonardo da Vinci. Picknett believes that Leonardo would have stopped at nothing to achieve a realistic image of a tortured and crucified man. When we look at the man on the shroud, we are not looking at just a painted image, because it's not a painting. We're looking at a photograph of a crucified man. Leonardo took a body from one of the stock of bodies he dissected for his anatomical research, and he truly crucified it. The body on the shroud may be one of the many cadavers that Leonardo dissected, but what about the face? Finding the perfect face for Christ among the decayed bodies in the morgue would be next to impossible. So whose face did the artist and master of human proportions use as the model for Christ? The face on the cloth has become the world's enduring image of Jesus Christ. Before the Turin Shroud, Jesus was depicted in a variety of different ways. Some images show him clean-shaven and others full-faced. In some, he has blonde hair. In others, short hair. The Turin Shroud permanently fixed the image of Christ in people's minds, once and for all. Whoever created this image set out to create a face people would truly believe was the Son of God. So who is this man? Incredibly, the answer may have been staring us in the face for centuries. In 2009, a photographer and computer artist discovered clues in the image which may finally reveal the identity of this man. And could confirm Leonardo's involvement in the fraud of the millennium. In 1987, Lillian Schwartz, graphic designer from Bell Laboratories, made a series of detailed scientific measurements of two faces. One was Da Vinci's painting, The Mona Lisa. 
The other was a self-portrait of Leonardo as an old man. When Schwartz compared the images, she made a discovery that rocked the art world. I saw this image coming down. It was half of Leonardo and half of Mona Lisa. And it was up at the top of the head, and there were the hairlines that lined up. And then it came down slowly, and the eyes lined up. It was difficult to contain myself, and by the time the nose tips, that's when I screamed. Amazingly, the two faces matched perfectly. All human faces are unique. Like snowflakes, no two are exactly the same. So finding a match convinced Schwartz that da Vinci must have used his own face as the model for the Mona Lisa. To test her discovery, she took detailed measurements of key features on the two faces. The inner canvas, the corner of the eyes, the distance between the center of the eyes, the length of the nose, and the area above the eyes, known as the suborbital ridge. Again, the face's proportions matched perfectly. The discovery was groundbreaking. So if da Vinci had the audacity to use his own face for the beautiful Mona Lisa, could he have used it as the model for the shroud image? Well, when I first was asked to do some analysis between Leonardo and the shroud, I said, no way, this, this is not gonna fit his canon of proportions. It's just not connected in any way. Schwartz digitized da Vinci's self-portrait into the computer and compared it to the shroud image. But the angle of the two faces was so different, it was impossible to compare. I realized I couldn't do that kind of analysis because the faces had to be oriented in the same direction. But in January 2009, Schwartz began to analyze a different drawing by da Vinci. This study of a man's face is just one of thousands da Vinci made exploring facial proportions. He was obsessed with finding the formula for the perfect face. When Schwartz measured the key features on this sketch and compared them with the measurements taken from the shroud, she was shocked by the results. I pulled up this image that Leonardo had uh, drawn showing his proportions on a face. I felt uh, I wasn't going to find anything just, just looking at them. But then I scaled and bisected the two images to see what that would pull up. To Schwartz's surprise, the proportions of the two faces matched perfectly. The eyes had lined up, and you can almost follow the top of the head around to the head of the shroud. And I kept saying, no, 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 that's, that can't be. But then there was the tips and the mouths. And again, it matched. I'm excited about this. I mean, I really, you know, to discover something makes you feel really, really good. Schwartz doesn't know who created the man's image on the shroud, but she can prove that whoever did must have used da Vinci's system of proportions. There's no doubt in my mind with all the studies I've done in the last few weeks that the proportions that Leonardo wrote about were used in creating this shroud's face. And there were more surprises in store for Schwartz. This painting is the Salvatore Mundi, which some art historians believe is a portrait of Leonardo da Vinci as a young man. When Schwartz compared this image with the shroud image, she found a near perfect match. I was stunned. The match is, is inconceivable to me. I mean, it, it really is so close. Certainly the main tips of noses and center of eyes, which are very important, it matches. This match tells Schwartz that the two faces must belong to the same person. So could the mysterious shroud image which has fascinated the world for centuries, be a portrait of Leonardo da Vinci.
the image of the face of the man on the shroud and the face of the Salvatore Mundi match exactly in every way. It was spooky, it was jaw-dropping, and it was, I think, the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me. It's the connection we'd always been looking for, to prove a connection between Leonardo and the shroud, but also something that superficially we almost weren't expecting, because you look at the two images, they don't look that much alike, but when you do that test with them and you find they correspond absolutely precisely, the Salvatore Mundi is as good as Leonardo's signature on the shroud. Lynn Pignan and Clive Prince think the Renaissance master made a cast of his own face, which he then photographed. Leonardo is the face of the Mona Lisa, the most beautiful woman in the world, and the face on the Turin Shroud, the face of the Son of God. Um, we think he intended both of those to be great jokes on posterity and they've been very successful jokes for 500 years. If Leonardo could have known that 500 years after he died, um, generations of pilgrims are still crossing themselves over the image of himself, I think he would have laughed quite a lot. And I think he would have felt that he'd succeeded in what he set out to do. Leonardo's dissections gave him access to dead bodies and blood. His fascination with light and lenses may have led to a photographic technique. Combined with his sheer audacity and ambition, da Vinci had every opportunity to create this forged relic, the most outrageous hoax of all time. When I see the Turin Shroud, um, I still have a sense of awe associated with it, but it's awe for the the science behind it, the method by which it was created, the ingenuity that went into it. The main thing to understand about Leonardo da Vinci was that he had a hunger to leave something for the future, to make his mark the future. I mean, not just for the sake of art or science for its own sake, but because of his ego. Today, the Shroud of Turin lies undercover, shielded from prying eyes. The Catholic Church has refused any further scientific tests. Until more analysis is allowed, this image will remain one of the most fascinating and enduring mysteries of our time. But whatever theories appear in the future, they will have to explain why the face on the shroud and the face on this 500-year-old painting are almost identical.